So some of you might not know this, but uh, over on my Twitter, I like to drunk tweet movies. Uh, my Twitter, for the record, is at Matt underscore presents. I know not all of you follow it. Go check it out. It's at Matt underscore presents. I drunk tweet movies. It's fun. Now, typically, I will drunk tweet recent flops. Uh, this is how I watched, you know, uh, Book of Henry, Serenity, The Snowman, Cats. That's just the context I, I talked about those under and, and watched those under. But, you know, with 2020, there were a lot fewer uh, d d recent flops. Because there were a lot fewer movies. In fact, I, I only drunk tweeted two 2020 movies. Uh, Sonic and Assassin 33 AD. Now, I will also drunk tweet infamous movies, and I do take suggestions. So, um, uh, at the suggestion of friends and fans alike, I have drunk tweeted No Holds Barred, Joysticks, Atop of the Fourth Wall, the movie. You'll have to forgive me. There's a fucking thunderstorm going on. But this is the only night I can record this, so you're just gonna have to deal with a thunderstorm going on. So yeah, 2020, I, I'm basically stuck drunk tweeting infamous movies and fan suggestions, and I'm like, what I really need is a franchise. And I, I've drunk tweeted a couple franchises before. I, I did the Fifty Shades movies a while ago. And, uh, actually, just before this, I drunk tweeted all of the Left Behind movies. If you're curious about my ranking for those, number one is the, the Nicolas Cage one, and all three Kirk Cameron movies are tied for last place. Not second place, last place. But I, I wanted a long franchise, something that could, like, keep me going a couple weeks. So basically I needed a franchise that was six or more movies, that I had seen little to none of, that I had basically no expectations for, and also that I had easy access to. Enter Ernest. Hey Vern, working your way up in the world, eh? Whew, sure is high. And speaking of high, Vern... I'm out of focus. Am I like really out of focus or am I just drunk? Ernest P. Worrell is a character created by comedian Jim Varney, uh, best known for playing the Slinky Dog in Toy Story 1 and 2, and also Cookie in Atlantis. Um, he was one of the two characters that were recast for the sequel. Uh, Ernest started off in a bunch of commercials in the early 80s, uh, and eventually the character was popular enough that he got picked up for both a TV show and a movie, uh, I believe were made concurrently, but the TV show might have been first, I'm not sure. But anyways, he, he got his own movie, and then they just kept making earnest movies. They made nine of these movies between 1987 and 1998, so... Eleven years and nine movies, plus one other, like, kinda earnest movie. We'll talk about that one. As well as a handful of TV shows, a handful of, uh, TV specials, like, hour-long TV specials. Full disclosure, I only watched the ten movies, nine and a half movies, however you want to count that. Uh, not any of the TV specials, definitely none of the TV shows. What I found while making this is that the Ernest fan base is very much alive and thriving. Uh, so no, I did not delve into all of the Ernest lore. I'm sorry, I only watched the ten movies. In fact, uh, as I was working on this... I discovered a very interesting podcast called the Ernest P. Worrell Preservation Society, a group of Ernest fans who have somehow attained, obtained, somehow obtained, a binder full 
of unused pitches for Ernest movies. So, big shout out to the Ernest P. Worrell Preservation Society. I, I highly recommend that. They pretty blatantly say in their first episode, they're just gonna, like, retweet anyone who's talking about Ernest to, to promote the show, just so, like, people will find out about it, but I guess it worked. It's, a, it's an interesting show. I recommend it. Ernest P. Worrell Preservation Society. Links in the down there part. It's kind of astounding to me which Ernest movies didn't get made, considering stuff like Slam Dunk Ernest did get made. But he, he was kind of perfect, because the Ernest movies have this sort of reputation as being very lowbrow and not very good. And also, all of them but one were available through IMDb TV or my local library. The only one I couldn't get, I had to order it from uh, Netflix DVD, was Ernest Saves Christmas, which is weird because I'm pretty sure that's the most popular one. But it was just sort of the perfect franchise to drunk tweet. For the record, uh, I just opened this bottle. Like, right before I started recording, I opened this bottle. So as it starts to, like, dip down, just know I, I'm doing that all while I'm recording. We're gonna go from worst to best with this, so... Starting off with the worst Ernest movie. <laughs> Ernest Goes to School earns the lowest spot on this list, not for being annoying, not for being stupid, not for being unfunny, but for being boring. This is, this is such a nothing movie. I, I felt nothing watching this. I, I never laughed at any of the jokes, but at the same time, I didn't think any of the jokes were, like, groan-worthy. It's just, okay. It, it probably doesn't help that the plot's a little all over the place. It, it's, the basic premise is that uh, Ernest is a school janitor, but a new city ruling says all school employees must have a high school diploma. And Ernest doesn't have a high school diploma. Shock of shocks. So Ernest now has to graduate high school in order to keep being a janitor. But then he has a crush on, like, the band teacher. So it turns into, like, Ernest trying to inspire the, the band and also, like, the football team gets incapacitated, and it's up to Ernest to, like, help the football team, fix the football team, and there's also these, like, crazy scientists that work at the high school, and they have this, like, brain-enhancing machine, and they enhance Ernest's brain so he's smarter, and it's, like, this is, like, Three or four scripts all mashed into one. It's Ernest finishes high school. Ernest saves the football team. Ernest saves the marching band. And Ernest becomes a super genius. And they just sort of like mashed them together into one movie. Because they couldn't flesh out one of those enough to be its own movie. And it just... It doesn't work. It's really lame. It's really unfunny. Worth noting, this is the only Ernest film not directed by John R. Cherry III. It was directed, I believe, by Coke Sams, who was a producer on most of the uh, Ernest movies. And he only took over on this one because he needed credits to get into, like, the Director's Guild. And, and it, like, uh, John R. Cherry was willing to, like, step down and let him get that. But... <laughs> It's just, you know, very odd that The Worst Movie is also the only movie not directed by John R. Cherry. And I don't think John Cherry would have improved this movie. I, I think it would have been absolute trash regardless. I'm not blaming Coke Sams for this. It's just kind of interesting, kind of coincidental that the worst film is the only one not directed by the same guy. 
I, I have nothing more to say. It's, it's a boring movie and I don't like it. Following Just Behind Goes to School is the penultimate Ernest film, Ernest Goes to Africa. Which, incidentally, is kind of the reason I ended up doing the Ernest movies. I was watching Shaft Goes to Africa, and I'm like, wait, isn't there an Ernest movie where he goes to Africa? And in thinking that, I'm like, oh shit, Ernest would be the perfect franchise to drunk tweet. Ernest Goes to Africa is... Kind of exactly as problematic as you'd think it was, but not really in the ways you think it would be. It's not really that racist towards Africans. But there is a scene where Ernest does brown face and impersonates an Indian person. Hey, you. At your service, Saeed. Service is my middle name. Well, actually, my middle name is Garala. <laughs> this was 97. This was the second to last Ernest movie. How did that fly? How did that fly in 1997? I mean, I guess there's also that uh, Dennis the Menace movie where Carrot Top does brown face. Dr. Shashi Kasha. Very pleased to make an acquaintance. I don't remember when that came out, but I've seen that one too. Uh, in Ernest Goes to Africa, this, like, explorer steals these diamonds from this African tribe, that this, like, deep in the jungle, isolated African tribe. He steals these diamonds from them, and then someone steals the diamonds from him, and then someone steals the diamonds from those guys, and that guy tries hiding the diamonds by, like, dropping them in this uh, bin at a flea market. And what do you know, Ernest comes by and buys those diamonds and then turns them into a yo-yo. So the people who are looking for those diamonds believe Ernest is this secret agent, uh, like Agent 32 or something, who never shows up in the movie. The, the agent never appears. Like, I, I was expecting some sort of, I don't know, man who knew too much or like North by Northwest twist where, where the agent would show up and help Ernest. And he just doesn't. The agent just never shows up in the movie. But they, they believe Ernest has these diamonds and they kidnap him and this girl he has a crush on off out to, uh... Africa, obviously. Obviously they're going to Africa. It's in the title. And, you know, Ernest and the girl escape and they run off into the jungle and they, they encounter the tribe that these diamonds were stolen from. And they kind of end up giving the diamonds back to them. That's the plot. While, while these bad guys chase them trying to get the diamonds. It's, it's not good. It's not funny. It's, in fact kind of culturally insensitive at times. But it's still better than goes to school because I, I laughed twice at this. They were light chuckles, and I couldn't even tell you which two jokes I laughed at, but I did laugh at this movie, which is more than I can say about goes to school. This also has the highest body count of any Ernest movie, so I guess it kind of gets points for that too. Like, points for daring to kill off, like, five people. Like, five people die in this movie. It's... Which is a low body count, for sure, for sure. But it's an earnest movie, and earnest movies don't typically have body counts. Some of them do. One or two of them do. But this is the highest at five. Ernest goes to Africa. Don't like it. So it's the mid-90s. Basketball is, like, the biggest fucking thing. You know, this is, like, when Air Bud's coming out. This is, like, a year before Space Jam. Everyone's fascinated with basketball, you know. It's it's the height of, like, 
Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and that other guy who was really popular in the 90s, Charles Barkley, uh, all of them, Dennis Rodman. You know, in, the NBA is the hot thing. Basketball is the hot thing. So, of course, Ernest has to do a movie playing basketball. So, Ernest works for this, like, independent contractor janitorial service who are hired to, like, clean up this mall. And, um, it, it's all black people except Ernest, which feels really weird. Like, you couldn't have thrown, like, one token white guy in there that wasn't Ernest. And this is, like, peak white guys writing black guys. Like, you can tell this is shit black people wouldn't say. This is some shit a white guy wrote for them. Excuse me, brother. Oh, yeah. Excuse mm. me. Uh -huh. Don't play yourself like mm. that. Someone calls Ernest a cracker in this movie. It's the hardest working cracker in basketball! That's weird. Like, I, I have way- I'm way more uncomfortable with the race politics of this movie than I am goes to Africa. So anyway, he's part of this janitorial staff, and he ends up knocking over this statue, which breaks the light, which causes a fire, and so the janitorial staff get in trouble, and Ernest sort of steps forward and is like, hey, this is my fault. And then all the other guys are, like, congratulating him, like, oh, Ernest, thanks for taking the fall, man. How can we repay you for taking the fall here? And I'm like, it's his fault, though. Like, you don't have to thank Ernest for taking the fall on something that is totally his fault. Although... Honestly, it's probably the mall owner's fault for having that statue. Because it doesn't even seem like he he knocked the... It didn't seem hard to knock over the statue, right? He just kind of pushed it and it went down. So this is kind of his fault for not, like, bolting that to the floor. Kind of seems like it was destined to fall over. And especially if it can fall over and start a fire. That's a fucking hazard. That's on you, my dude. Anyways, they're congratulating Ernest and they're like, Oh, is there anything we can do for you? And he's like, Oh, let me play in your intramural basketball team. And they're all like, Oh, we don't want Ernest on our team. No way, man. And the, the coach and also, like, the boss of the independent contracting group is like, listen, he helped us out, he can be a part of the team, we just won't play him, you know? He can sit on the bench the whole time. But then, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar shows up as the Archangel of Basketball and gives Ernest a magical pair of sneakers which make him amazing at basketball. That, that is that is the weirdest fucking plot. Across all of these Ernest movies, that has to be the weirdest thing that happens. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar shows up as the fucking archangel of basketball. And it's also implied that the mall owner that they deal with is like a demon who is in competition with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So anyways, Ernest is now super good at basketball, and he lets it go to his head, and he's like a big superstar, and then, you know, he has to, like, give up the shoes for the team, and but, but they still need him to make, like, one last basket, and he does it. Hooray. Ernest is successful even without the magic shoes. They, they say they don't want Ernest on their team because he's too short and, like, not good at basketball. And I get it, Ernest is clumsy, he's really not someone you want on the court, but Jim Varney was 6'1". That's not short. And also, you can tell in some of the close-ups of, like, his arms in these movies, the dude is fucking jacked. Like, I was not prepared for this. Ernest has just so much fucking mass. He, his arms are huge. <laughs> like, 
My god, I was not prepared for how buff Ernest was. So yeah, I, I feel like, in spite of his clumsiness, he would be an asset in a basketball game. Yeah, this one gets points for the sheer fucking weirdness of having Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as an archangel who helps Ernest. That's some fucking insanity. Points for that. But otherwise, eh, it's not a super fun or enjoyable movie. There's not really that much to say about it. It's just like, all right, Ernest basketball movie, let's go. Uh, apart from like the weird supernatural angle it decides to take, it's like, yeah, this, this seems, this is exactly what I expected. I'm surprised there weren't more Ernest movies about him, like, achieving stardom and then sort of, like, becoming a prick because of his stardom. Also, nearly all of these Ernest movies have some love interest for him, which is stupid. Ernest does not need a love interest. I wish they'd quit doing that, but they do it all the way to the final film of the franchise. There are a couple where he doesn't have a love interest, but most of them he has a love interest. And this is the only time I feel like he could do better than his love interest. Like, his love interest in this movie, she starts off as this, like, kind of like the discount version of Annie Potts from Ghostbusters. So, like, like Janine in, like, season four or five of real Ghostbusters. But then, like, Ernest gets super famous and rich, and she's only into him for the fame and the money. And it's like, oh, wow, you're actually really shallow. For the first time, Ernest could do better. And I kind of feel like that's how they should have gone with a lot of the love interests in this franchise. Like, they only like Ernest for some small, shallow thing. And then, like, when he finds that out, he's like, nah, get out of my life, chick. Slam dunk Ernest. Points for weirdness, but not much else. You know why I don't drink booze while I film? It dehydrates you. I need water to, like, counteract this so I can speak. <laughs> Ernest Rides Again. Easily the lamest title. Like, you couldn't have called it, like, Ernest and the Crown Jewels, or the Ernest who was king, or King Ernest, Ernest's Family Jewels. Rides Again is so boring, it tells me nothing about this movie. In Ernest Rides Again, Ernest is a groundskeeper at a university, and he's kind of friends with this uh, history professor. And this history professor is working on this sort of controversial theory that this sort of, this, uh, independent guerrilla team during the Revolutionary War stole the crown jewels from Britain and hid them somewhere in the Americas. Which, which doesn't go over well, but as it happens, Ernest stumbles upon some proof that this regiment actually existed. And so he, he takes the professor to the site, and they kind of poke around, and they find this cannon that, according to legend, has the crown jewels in it. But as it happens, one of the guys this professor has told about this theory is this crazy, evil, rich dude... Who's, who really wants the crown jewels back. And also MI6 is tracking them. In case the, the crown jewels legend turns out to be true, they want the crown jewels back. Oh man, the rain just started like way fucking harder. Enjoy the soothing sounds of rain as I talk about Ernest. So they find this cannon that allegedly has the diamonds in it, or allegedly has the crown jewels in it. But Ernest gets stuck inside the cannon, and the bad guy is like, ah, just cut him out. 
And it's like, ooh, evil bad guy's gonna kill Ernest. But then when Ernest gets out of the cannon, unharmed, he still tries to kill Ernest for no apparent reason. Just because he's an evil bastard. No reason. He's just evil. He just wants to kill Ernest. And then Ernest finds the crown jewels, and the crown gets stuck on his head, and it's kind of ridiculous, because you can tell the crown is not actually stuck on his head. They're just sort of like, ooh, we gotta get this off. But there's a point where, like, he tilts his head back too far, and the crown, like, slips off slightly, and they're still like, ooh, we can't get it off. There's a little charm to this movie. There's a couple funny moments, but especially with the villain, I kind of like the villain of this movie. He just like, like that he's so prepared to fucking execute Ernest. I, I really like that. I really like any time this franchise gets a little darker, I'm here for it. There's also um, the professor's wife who actually went on to appear in a couple more Ernest movies. I, I said she looked like a white Maya Rudolph. But she's a really funny character because she just keeps stealing people's cars. She, this character is just a fucking car thief. That she just steals... She steals like three different people's cars in this movie. Yeah, so some funny stuff about this movie... That isn't really Ernest related, but ultimately, not my favorite thing. Also, Ernest Rides Again feels like a transition to a different era of Ernest. Like, there's the early popular Ernest movies, and then Rides Again is the transition to, like, the later series, straight to video, no one cares, L crap movies. The The later movies are not as good as the earlier movies, but I will say there is one later movie I like better than the rest. <laughs> Ernest in the Army, hot take, it's the last movie, but it is far from the worst movie. It is better than all of the other late series Ernest movies. Like, for starters, it has Ernest interacting with a child, which I feel like is kind of a necessary component to the Ernest movies. Ernest is always best when he's like, he has like a child companion, right? This is like a children's series, and there's always a little more heart when you see Ernest helping a child rather than just, like, messing around with a bunch of adults. Also, there's a couple jokes in this one that I really like. Are you a mirage? Uh, no, ma'am. Southern Baptist. Frankly, where it goes to Africa feels really dated, like it should have come out well before 1997. In the Army feels like it's from later than 1998. Like, it was ahead of its time. There is evidence that he has a Pluton missile. Ah, Washington doesn't want to mess up the oil prices, huh? Like, clearly it was pulling from the Gulf War, but it feels like something from, like, mid-Bush administration when the Iraq War had started, which is weird because Jim Varney died before Bush ever took office. Hell, there's weirdly some, like, political commentary in this film is so basically Ernest joins the army reserves specifically so that he can drive all of the big cars the army has around and this feels like the devolution of a character because he has a hard time driving the big trucks around he's like a reckless driver in this movie when in previous films we've seen him drive a garbage truck with no problem. And also, in Ernest Rides Again, he drives a cannon, which has no steering mechanisms, yet he still manages to make it go, like, around corners and avoid things in a way y you wouldn't be able to do if it were just 
a cannon rolling down a hill, which is what it's supposed to be. So he can control a cannon, but he can't control a truck. And then there's this uh, Middle Eastern prince who gets a hold of a, a plutonium bomb. They kidnap, like, a general who turns out is actually working with them. He has backstabbed the American army. And a news reporter that Ernest has a crush on. So Ernest... Uh, somehow this reserves troop gets selected to go out to this country to stop the bomb threat, which seems ridiculous in and of itself. But then Ernest has to go rescue this girl and the general. And I gotta say, coming hot off the heels of Goes to Africa, the one with the highest body count, they seem apprehensive to kill anyone in this movie, despite all the guns and bombs and car wrecks in this movie. No one dies, not even, like, the evil general. Like, there's a moment where it seems like the evil general has died, and then it's like, oh, no, he just, like, crashed into the sand. He's fine. Still, though, it, it's still funnier than a lot of the late series Ernest movies, and I feel like it just has more heart than a lot of the late series Ernest movies. Like, again, that's really the advantage of having Ernest deal with kids. It just, it, it gives the movie a lot more heart when that happens. Yeah, Ernest and the Army. For the final installment of the franchise, it was... refreshing? Not exactly good, but... Better than what they had been making up to that point. Also, to be clear, this was not supposed to be the last Ernest movie. They actually had a couple other Ernest movies planned, um, including what was supposed to be the finale of the Ernest series, Ernest and Son, where supposedly Ernest was gonna, like, pass the torch down to the next generation of Ernest. However, uh, according to uh, John R. Cherry, the director of all these movies, which let me just say, I am so impressed that they got the same director and, and most of the same producers back for every single Ernest movie. John R. Cherry said uh, early in production of this film, he thought uh, Jim Varney was going to be able to bounce back from throat cancer, but by the end of it, he could tell, like, Varney was really, really sick, and he's like, all right, we're done with Ernest movies. This is the last one. Until Jim gets better, this is the last Ernest movie, and Jim didn't get better. He died tragically young in 2000. I guess not, not that young. He was 50, but still... Still, that feels real premature. Like, I feel like we could still have Jim Varney around. Remember, kids, smoking is bad for you. Let's move on to the early franchise Ernest movies, which I actually think are significantly better than the later ones. Like, there's just a, a clear divide between these two things. Goes to Jail is my least favorite of these early movies, but there's still a lot about it that I honestly kind of like. For starters, it has the best joke of any Ernest movie. Real men are not intimidated by physical threats against their personal selves, and ironically, neither am I. Uh, in the movie, there's like this notorious crime boss who's in jail, and he's played by Jim Varney, so he looks just like Ernest. And Ernest happens to have jury duty for uh, one of the prisoners that knows this big crime boss guy. So the word kind of gets back to the big crime boss guy like, Hey, there's this, you know, Patsy who looks just like you. What if we switched him out, you know? 
you know, make make the boss look like Ernest so he can leave and make Ernest look like the boss so he has to stay here. And I gotta say, I really like Jim Varney as a villain. I wish Jim Varney had played more villains. He's really enjoyable in this role. Honestly, there's a part of me that wishes Jim Varney hadn't done all these Ernest movies because he's such a good actor. I want to see him in other things. Like, I really like him as Slinky Dog. He's a really good Slinky Dog. I, I wish he had done stuff that wasn't Ernest. And it's really fun to see him play a villain in this movie. There's also just, like, weird stuff in this movie. Like, early in the movie, Ernest gets, like, electrocuted and it causes him to, like, have these magnetic powers. So then later in the movie, when they think he's this big crime boss, he he's, like, sent to the electric chair. And the electric chair just gives him superpowers. He, he just gains electric powers from the electric chair. He's... He's like the fucking Emperor Palpatine yelling unlimited power and, like, electrocuting motherfuckers as he's escaping jail. <laughs> so that's fucking wild. Also, uh, in this movie, Ernest works at a bank. He's a janitor for a bank. So, of course, the criminal is gonna rob that bank. And, uh, he has, like, a bomb to, like, blow open the, uh, vault doors. And the way Ernest deals with this is the same way Superman deals with this in the beginning of Superman 2. He takes the bomb and he flies really high into the air with his electric powers and throws the bomb into space. It's a weird one. It's definitely a weird one, but you know, I like weird ones, so fine by me. I gotta say, bold move making like the third outing with this character, him going to jail. Like that seems like something you save for late into the franchise. And to be fair, he didn't actually go to jail. He just swapped places with a prisoner. I was kind of disappointed by that. I wanted Ernest to commit a crime and get arrested for that crime. But... Still, it's, it's an odd choice to have, like, the second or third outing with this children's character. Him going to jail. <laughs> Yeah, definitely some laughs to be had with this one. Not their best work, but... Eh. I... It's... It's, it's fine. If you like Ernest, you'll like this one. <laughs> Ernest Saves Christmas. Probably the most popular installment of this franchise. Maybe Scared Stupid. Uh, I mean, good idea to lead off with, like... Christmas and Halloween right at the start, so it's like, every Christmas and every Halloween, we got people watching Ernest movies. Honestly, Saves Christmas is probably not as funny as Goes to Jail, but I, I do think it's a lot more charming. I think it's got a lot more heart than Goes to Jail. Like, Goes to Jail is just kind of simple. It's like, whoops, Ernest is in jail now. Hijinks ensue. Whereas this one, I, I think, has a lot more of a heart. So Ernest is a taxi driver, and he picks this guy up from the airport, who turns out to be Santa Claus. Um, not the original Santa Claus. It turns out Santa Claus is a job handed down, uh, like, generation after generation. There's, like, a limit to the Santa magic you get. And when your Santa magic runs out, you have to appoint a new Santa. So this guy is probably, you know, the fifth or sixth Santa down the line. And he's come to uh, Orlando, Florida to appoint the new Santa Claus, who's this, like, 
TV entertainer who's he's like good with kids and he's he's very kind. He he's always like helping out at like orphanages and whatnot. That's where they find him. He's helping out like a children's home for Christmas. Um, but his agent wants him to do this like I, I think it's a horror film actually. He wants him to be in this horror movie, and this this other guy is like uh, Santa. It's Santa. Santa is like, no, come be Santa for me. Uh, so it's this, like, back and forth between his agent, who wants him to, like, do more stuff to make money, and Santa, who wants him to be Santa. Which I feel like is a concept that doesn't require Ernest. Like, <laughs> you could have cut Ernest from this movie... And it'd probably still be just as good. Maybe even better. <laughs> Ernest is in it for, like, slapsticky hijinks. I was kind of hoping he would end up appointing Ernest Santa. So this could be, like, the final episode of the Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. L look it up. The final episode of the Sonic cartoon ends with Santa appointing Sonic... Santa Claus. That series ends. The final episode of that series is Sonic the Hedgehog becoming Santa. Ernest, unfortunately, does not become Santa. Uh, he's j he's helps Santa, and Santa is like, Oh, thank you very much, Ernest. Let me reward you with some magical thing. I don't even think he gets a reward, actually. I think Santa just says thank you to him. Maybe he, like, gets his job back or something. This was a while ago. It's been ten weeks, y'all. Also, I was drunk while I was watching these. So if I get some details wrong, you know who to blame. So yeah, Ernest is chauffeuring him around. And also, uh, around that time, he encounters this troubled teen from the local youth center and like you know she's a punk she's all edgy and she's you know she doesn't have a family so she's all like angry with the world and then like Ernest shows her the true meaning of Christmas so like she, she steals Santa's sack so she can get like whatever she wants out of it because it's like a magic sack that just produces whatever so she steals the sack to, like, get whatever she wants, but then, you know, because of, like, Ernest and Santa, she's, she feels all guilty about it. So she brings the sack back to him. Very touching. Merry Christmas. Like, on the one hand, it's a little sappy, but on the other hand, I, I do think it has genuine heart to it, like... The guy who plays Santa in this movie is really good. Like, probably one of my favorite Santas I've seen in a movie. Santa is just a role that is constantly played really poorly. And it's weird that there's so many bad movies where Santa is played perfectly. Like, one of my favorite Santas is the Santa from Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. I just think he does a great job. I think he embodies Santa. And the Santa from uh, Ernest Saves Christmas. Also a really good Santa. I really like him. Yeah, not as funny as Goes to Jail, but a lot more heart. I, I enjoy it. Just a little bit more. You know, it's close. I feel like... I, I almost feel like I could flip these two. Like, I, 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 could, I could put Goes to Jail higher than than Saves Christmas. Like, there's a cynical side of me that wants that. It's like, eh, Goes to Jail is funnier. Put that higher. But then it's like, nah, but Saves Christmas has so much heart. They're tied. I'll just say they're tied. Who cares? It's my list. They're tied. <laughs> Ernest Scared Stupid. Uh, the Halloween movie. A movie I feel benefits a lot from the supernatural angle. Like, I, I think this is more interesting 
because there's, like, this monster stalking around trying to, like, capture the kids. And that's not really something Ernest has dealt with. I mean, obviously there's Slam Dunk Ernest, where he meets a fucking archangel. What the fuck? But that's a little... That's a lot weirder than this. This, I feel like, is easy enough to swallow. At least as easy to swallow as, like, Santa Claus. You know? Santa Claus is a pretty normal supernatural thing. So at the beginning of this movie, there's, like, this evil troll man in, like, the 1800s who, like, has terrorized this small community so they, like, execute him and they bury him under this tree and, and like, the priest is there to, like, condemn him to the earth. And as it happens, the priest is a Worrell. He's one of Ernest's ancestors. And so the, the troll man says, like, Oh, I'll be back to stalk the earth uh, when one of the Worrells resurrects me on Halloween night. So then we cut to the present, and Ernest has all these, like, uh, kid friends. He's, he's like a janitor for the school, and he's friends with a bunch of kids, which I, I recognize in modern day that seems kind of creepy, but... For the Ernest movies, he really fucking needs kids. Like, Ernest is at his best when he is working off children. So he has these kids, kid friends, and they want to build, like, the ultimate treehouse where they can, like, fend off all the bullies. So they go deep into the woods and they find the tree that the troll man was buried under. And... They set up a treehouse there. Eartha Kitt shows up. And my god, Eartha Kitt fucking killing it in this movie. <laughs> I I mean, Eartha Kitt's a good actress. I like Eartha Kitt. But, I, I mean, I, I don't know. In, in, in an earnest movie, she's like a light in the darkness. She's just amazing in this film, comparatively. I feel like if she did this performance in a better movie, she might not be as good. It might just me be me, you know, watching an earnest movie and going, Oh shit, it's Eartha Kitt, and she is doing a passable job. That makes her better than everyone else, but... Fuck it, Eartha Kitt's in this movie, and I fucking love her. I love her in this movie. Eartha Kitt plays this old lady everyone thinks is a witch. And she sort of tells Ernest about the curse. And she just straight up tells him the magic words he needs to resurrect the troll. She's like, Ernest, make sure you don't say these words. And what do you know? Ernest says these words, and it resurrects the troll. Now, I, I criticized this on Twitter, and someone replied to me saying it was a setup, because uh, the troll turns children into wood statues. That's his power. But if the troll is defeated, the children return to their natural forms. And as it happens... Eartha Kitt still has, like, her brother and her two sisters as wood statues. So when the troll's defeated, her statues turn back into her siblings. So maybe she just told Ernest this so that he would resurrect the troll so that she could save her siblings? It is, it is a distinct possibility she told him this on purpose. But... In the film, it really seems like she's trying to stop him from resurrecting the troll. Something she utterly fails to do. So, I don't know, interpret that as you will. Either it was genius reverse psychology to get Ernest to resurrect this troll, or she's just stupid. Anyway, he resurrects this troll, and the troll turns all of the kids into wood, 
and he has to find this special way to, like, defeat the troll. So he looks it up to, like, find the way to defeat these trolls, and it's, oh, you have to use M-I letter missing K. And so he finds something called Miak to defeat the trolls, when it's clearly milk. Like, clearly it's supposed to say milk, and it's even been demonstrated that the trolls are afraid of milk at this point. So, clearly it's supposed to be milk, but he goes out and finds Miak, which I think is kind of a funny joke. But yeah, it's, it's milk. Milk defeats these trolls. And, you know, Ernest fe- the defeats the troll, saves the kids, hooray, happy Halloween for everyone. Yeah, I, I like the supernatural angle. It, it adds a lot to the movie. Also, Eartha Kitt adds a lot to the movie. I like her a lot in this film. And again, it's Ernest working off kids, which is where I think he is at his best. This film begins, like the opening credits play over footage from like old B-movies. It's clear like Jim Varney and co really knew their stuff when it came to like old cheesy B-movies. They they reference them every now and then in the movies, and definitely in some of the unfinished scripts they did, uh, there's references to, like, cheesy old B-movies. So this movie opens with, like, footage of old cheesy horror movies, and the first clip, the first clip in this movie is from Giant Gila Monster. So... (laughs) That's how you get on my good side. Open with footage of giant Gila monster. Ernest scared stupid. I enjoyed it enough. Like, I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and claim it's like an absolute classic, that this was something you should watch every Halloween. But I enjoyed it enough. Dr. Otto and the Gloom Beam. This is the movie Jim Varney and co. made before the Ernest movies. And it is arguably an Ernest movie. He does play Ernest in it. But we'll get to that. So Dr. Otto is this crazy mad scientist who, who invents this machine that can, like, deactivate credit cards and, like, delete numbers from banking systems, and it's it's gonna fuck up the whole economy. So he uses it on, like, Idaho? He uses it on one of those, like, northern states, like, on the border of Canada. I forget which one. It's been a while. This was the first one I watched. So this was literally ten weeks ago we're talking about. He uses this crazy machine to, like, destroy the economy. So this, like, heroic good guy comes to, like, fight him. But the heroic good guy is an incompetent dipshit. So this woman who's just, like, tagging along with him to make sure he does the right thing ends up being the hero of the movie, more or less. And Dr. Otto has set up all of these elaborate traps for them, and he he's always ready for them. And he has a machine, a, a, cof, a big coffin-shaped machine, which he does call the coffin throughout the film. And when he gets in it, it transforms him into another person. And one of the persons he turns into is a woman. Actually, a recurring character throughout the Ernest films, Auntie Nelda. She appears in a bunch of the Ernest movies. It's it's a persona Ernest does sometimes, is Auntie Nelda. So that means uh, Dr. Otto has a gender change coffin. So he, he uses this coffin to, like, turn him into all these, like, alternate personas. And it's kind of just an excuse for Jim Varney to show off, like all of the different characters he can play. Because he he does that from time to time in the Ernest movies. Like, Ernest will have to, like, disguise himself and pretend to be some other character and then 
Jim Farney gets to show off his impersonation skills. Um, like I mentioned, he does Auntie Nelda in a bunch of these earnest movies. So yeah, Dr. Otto keeps turning into all these weird characters. And then at the very end of the film, he, he like hops into the gender change coffin as it's like malfunctioning. And it turns him into Ernest. And and he, at that point, like, all, his lab blows up and all of his stuff blows up. So if you take this as canon to the Ernest series, Ernest is actually a mad scientist named Dr. Otto who, who only became Ernest because one of his crazy machines malfunctioned. And to back this up, Ernest keeps inventing, like, weird, strange machines in a bunch of the early movies. He, he has, like, the, the weird... Like, he has a weird washer-dryer machine going on in one of the early films. And it all seems to indicate that he's Dr. Otto. He's Dr. Otto, who has been sort of involuntarily transformed into this country yokel Ernest. I waited nine fucking movies. All nine movies. All I wanted was one fucking callback to Dr. Otto. Just reference Dr. Otto once. They never did. There was no Dr. Otto reference. After after Dr. Otto and the Gloom Beam, they stopped referencing Dr. Otto. I, I will say, maybe, maybe in Saves Christmas, there is a scene where his TV is on and he turns it off real quick. And it might have been Dr. Otto and the Gloom Beam that was on TV. But it also might not have been. That might be the singular reference to Dr. Otto and the Gloom Beam in the entire Ernest franchise. I really like Dr. Otto and the Gloom Beam. It's so fucking weird. I mean, I was just talking about, like, how Jim Varney and co. know they're, like, cheesy B-movies. And this is clearly a parody of, like, a bunch of cheesy B-movies. It's, you know... It, it, it's funny, for sure. It's it's pretty funny. Um, and very strange. Like, you, you, you don't expect this to be uh, Ernest's origins, you know? I, I mean, it's barely an Ernest movie. He shows up in, like, the last five minutes. And it's not even technically him. It's Dr. Otto who's been turned into him. But it still counts. He still played Ernest in this movie, so I started with this movie. Yeah, I I liked Dr. Otto and the Gloom Beam. Honestly, when I was watching it, I'm like, I don't think Ernest is going to be able to beat this. But he did. There, there's one Ernest movie that I think beats this. <laughs> Ernest goes to camp. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not, like, a great movie. This is not a movie you need to run out and see. Honestly, if you never watch a single Ernest movie, that's fine by me. But of all the Ernest movies, the one I can point to and say, I kind of liked that one. It's Ernest Goes to Camp. The very first Ernest movie, I, I kind of like it. It's not good. Don't, don't misread me. It's not some hilarious comedy that you're missing out on. In fact, uh, I really hate the cooks in this movie. The, the two cafeteria workers in this movie, I think, are really lame and really unfunny. And they keep getting, like, screen time. They're like the B-plot to the movie, and I'm like, stop, no, I don't want to see this, this is not funny. But the main plot, I ended up getting a lot of laughs out of it, 
And I think it has a lot of heart. I think there's a lot of heart to it. So, like, Ernest works at this summer camp, right? I forget what it's called. Uh, I, I was pleasantly surprised it was not some dumb, stupid joke like Camp I Wanna Pee Pee or something like that. You know, it was an actual camp name. I just forget what it was. And, and Ernest is like the groundskeeper, but he, he has aspirations of becoming a camp counselor. And as it happens, this camp has to take in a bunch of kids from the local uh, juvenile detention center. And they're like, no one wants to be the counselor for the kids from the juvenile detention center. So the guy who runs the camp is like, Ernest, you take the kids from the juvenile detention center. So, so Ernest is ecstatic to be like a camp counselor and, and he, t he gets all these like juvenile detention kids. And at first they're sort of mean to him. And so you, you get the sort of slapsticky hijinks you expect from Ernest. But then they start to like respect him. They start to like him. Because Ernest is, like, the only person who won't give up on these kids. He really wants them to succeed. And and then the camp's getting taken over by, like, this corporation. Which feels like a very cliché plot point. Like, oh no, the camp's being bought out by these rich people. There's, like, this fucking, like, all-out war between the campers and this corporation, and it's really funny to watch, really enjoyable to watch. Honestly, like, while I was watching this movie, it's like, it's like that meme of like, oh, I promise not to get political, three drinks later, here's the revolutionary Marxist undertones of Ernest Goes to Camp. Although, in my case, it was not three drinks, it was more like, nine or ten drinks, but I was ranting about the political undertones of Ernest Goes to Camp, so... You got me there. I don't know. Maybe it is just the booze talking, but... I kind of liked Ernest Goes to Camp. So that's all of the Ernest movies, ranked from worst to best. I have now seen every Ernest movie. Here's the thing I want to say about the Ernest movies. On the one hand, I would not recommend any of these movies to anyone. I probably will not be re-watching any of these movies, except maybe Dr. Otto. Dr. Otto is the only one I could see myself re-watching. It's, it's just not a franchise I think is very good. But on the other hand... I don't think Ernest has earned his reputation. Like, I went into this expecting Ernest to be this, like, annoying, terrible, insufferable character. And he just isn't. I, I mean, across nine movies, I was never annoyed by Ernest. But, like, say what you will about the Ernest movies, they're stupid, they're lowbrow, they're not very funny, but they're not annoying, which is what I expected. Now, part of that, I think, is Jim Varney. I think Jim Varney is a funny and charming actor. I, I think he's very charismatic. I, I really like Jim Varney. And he, he's not, like, a noisy character, I feel like a lot of, like, dumb slapsticky characters feel the need to, like, do this Anytime they're doing, like, slapstick shit and Ernest can, like, take a hit, go ooh, and just fall over. That's it. He's not, and he, he's not loud. He doesn't make a bunch of noise. He, he, he just, he takes his hits and he rolls with them. But I think the one thing that really makes Ernest, like, a, a, a good 
not annoying character is that he never annoys innocent people. Like, every now and then his clumsiness will make someone a little annoyed with him, but for the most part, his hijinks only ever end up hurting himself or an antagonistic character. And, and I think that does wonders for the character. Like, there's nothing I can't stand more than, like, a, a character who ruins someone else's life for no good reason. You know, it's why I kind of hate The Cable Guy and, and movies like The Cable Guy. But, but Ernest doesn't have that. Ernest has friends in all of these movies, and if not friends, at least people who, like, come to respect him by the end of the movie. He's, he's not an annoying person. He doesn't hurt innocent people. As an audience member, I, I have a hard time getting annoyed with him. He, he is not an annoying character, which I think is how he was stereotyped to me before I began this franchise. Honestly, I think I might miss Ernest a little bit. Not to the point that I will rewatch any of these movies. Not even to the point that I would watch the TV shows. But maybe enough that one day I might watch one of those TV specials. Uh, Ernest's family album looks interesting. I'd like to know what happens in that one. So yeah, I I'm putting a rest to the Ernest series, but you know what? I don't think he's bad as people have made him out to be. To you, Ernest. Now, I am going to take a few weeks because there's a couple individual movies I wanted to drunk tweet. Uh, someone asked that I drunk tweet Killer Pinata. Um, and I'm also looking at drunk tweeting Megan is Missing, Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. And maybe Hubie Halloween? That depends on whether or not my friend gets back to me about it in a timely manner. Because I have a friend who wants to watch that with me. After that, I'm thinking I'm going to drunk tweet the Paranormal Activities series. Um, I don't know how well that's going to work. These seem like they're just going to be, like, boring and obnoxious and not hilariously awful, but we're going to try. We're going to try to drunk tweet the Paranormal Activities movies. And if you've got a suggestion for a franchise you want me to drunk tweet, please leave it in the comments. Uh, I do not promise I am going to make a drunk video for all of these franchises. In fact, depending on how time-consuming this one is, this might be the last one, but I will definitely be drunk tweeting several franchises over on Twitter. So please let me know what you'd like to see me drunk tweet and maybe possibly drunk rank in the future. I do not promise there will be more of these videos. It is entirely dependent on how time consuming this video is and I mean I've already been recording for almost two hours now, so that's fun. To be fair, a lot of that was me just stopping to let thunder happen so that that doesn't show up in the recording, and also a lot of me drinking off camera. So that's the Ernest movies. Follow me on Twitter for more movie drunk tweeting. And until then, have a nice day. What? What's that, like a third of a bottle, maybe? That's looking pretty close to half, though. Yeah.